Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, my name is Anna Anario, and I'm part of the team here that helps make the park forums. Um, if you don't already know, the park forums have been happening for nearly 50 years here at um, our headquarters. And one of the areas that we do research in is computer vision, along with human machine intelligence. So it's very fitting for, to have David Rose here to speak today. So David Rose is an MIT researcher. He's an author and a serial entrepreneur. We're going to hear about SuperSight today, next platform of spatial computing. He's written a book on Internet of Things, IoT, uh, has a patent on photo sharing, as well as um, founded an AI company on computer vision. He's known for translating complex technologies to delightful, intuitive products. And on the side, as a hobby, he also is a tenor with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, so that's a, um, a little factoid for you. Um, and he's thinking about moving here to the Bay Area, but he needs to convince his wife. So please help me welcome David Rose. Thank you, Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, you, you know, you don't have to be very good if you're a tenor. Because you're because you're scarce, and <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to uh, uh, to present some ideas that are fresh and uh, get your feedback on them. I think we'll have time to to chat at the end. Um, uh, they're controversial, and I think they're kind of the things that we should be thinking about as we consider kind of this next wave of computing. Um, and uh, but to begin with, you should appreciate your eye. It's an incredible thing. It can see, it has millions of photoreceptors, discerns millions of colors, um, and moves at a peak velocity. It cicades at 900 degrees per second, which is three times around per second about, uh, a little less, um, which means that, that uh, it's one of the fastest muscles of the body, and most neuroscientists believe it's just part of the brain. Um, and, you know, the, the the things that we kind of know, uh, the only prosthetics that most of us wear uh, for the eyes were invented such a long time ago uh, in the 13th century, they were even considered fashionable way back then. Uh, today I work at a glasses company that makes hopefully fashionable glasses uh, called Warby Parker. Um, it has about 100 stores. They do half of the business online and half is through e-commerce. Um, and. Uh, you know, but really, like, I just feel like the evolution of the eye hasn't changed much um, uh, since those medieval prosthetics. Uh, and, but that's about to radically change, as you know, uh, because all of the big cloud players are spending many tens of millions of dollars on hiring many hundreds of engineers to work on the next evolution of the eye. Um, and I, I can't think of any of the big ones, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Samsung, Huawei, others, um, and about 50 other startups that we saw at the AWE conference. Some of my friends were there today. Um, augmented, what is it? Uh, augmented Reality Expo. Why is it called AWE then? Augmented, Rea augmented World Expo, anyway. Um, so there's so, there's so much, uh, uh, money that's pouring into this. There's so much ambition that's pouring into this. There's so many components that you need um, that uh, many, many new products are evolving uh, quickly. Uh, and you know, one of those um, that I recently tried is this company called North. Uh, they're, they were called Thalmic Labs before. Does anybody remember Thalmic? They made um, uh, a sensor for your forearm that was supposed to be the mouse of AR. So it would sense muscle movements so that it would know what you're, that you are pointing or doing other things with your hand. So they rebranded North, um, and these are some of the glasses. They only have two showrooms in the country, uh, but they have a laser projector in the temple of the glasses um, that can give you turn-by-turn uh, -turn directions, uh, messaging, uh, ETA for your Uber, what what song is playing, flashcards if you're trying to memorize something, or teleprompter if you're trying to give a talk. So that's why I'm so articulate, is because I'm, no, just kidding, I'm not wearing them. Um, <laughs> and probably the, the, 
the biggest technology that, that people um, in this world are excited about is what Microsoft and what um, uh, uh, Magic Leap are doing uh, in terms of putting not only um, information in your eyes, but also putting sensors on the front of your face and on these glasses to do um, simultaneous location and mapping so that the cameras see what you see and can superimpose data that's stuck to the world rather than stuck to your head. And uh, many designers are also speculating how uh, uh, Apple is getting into it in rose gold soon. Um, <clears throat> But really, the, the technology that, that is maybe most important um, that's going to make SLAM uh, interesting is scene segmentation. And that is a computer vision technology that's used to automatically discern which pixels are involved in cars or people or houses. And, uh, and, and I think you know, the, the way to think about this is um, you know, when the web brought about the ability to click on words, now we'll have the ability to kind of gesture at pixels. So the semantics of what is seen in front of us will be discernible, and the verbs will be attached to those things that are in our, in our field of view. Um, and the verbs might be, uh, learn more about that thing that I'm looking at, or uh, how do I get to there, or call that thing, or watch a preview of that, th or a uh, history of that thing, or connect to that person, or donate to that cause, or person, or um, bookmark that thing. Um, so I, th I think that's like, the, that's a profound difference in how we think, you know, how, how computing happens, and how it's, how it's spatialized and stuck to the things around us in the world. So tonight, I want to kind of tour through, I think, 10 um, uh, benefits that spatial computing hopes to provide to us and kind of consider those and, and then some of the downsides. Um, so they kind of go from the personal scale to the communal scale and, and interaction scale to the city scale or even uh, uh, satellite scale. Sound good? Uh, so the first, the first hope uh, or benefit I think that, that computer vision um, can provide is just the ability to label, to label the world around us, to label the people um, and the objects uh, and the things so that you know, we, this will be kind of a new cognitive crutch that we all have to not have to remember anything anymore because it will all be uh, done for us. Uh, kind of the po one of the positive ways that, that we're seeing this already um, uh, an app that I really love is called iNaturalist. Does anybody use iNaturalist? Yeah, good. Um, so it uses computer vision, so you can uh, label the bug or the bat or the heron. Um, and then they have this kind of workflow where it's casual grade recognized or, or needs an identifier or some expert in the field has, come, has, has taken a, a look at your bat photo and the results that the classifier provided and said, yes, that's truly a um, great blue heron. Uh, and maybe the most interesting thing is the metadata that's attached to that, which is by location. So I live here in Brookline in Boston, uh, right adjacent to a loud air conditioner on this Holiday Inn, um, right, <laughs> right here. And, uh, but you can see the interesting stuff that's happening from a, from a naturalist perspective is happening over at Amory Playground, where lots of things are being identified. So you can kind of, it's a way of finding the uh, naturalist hotspots around you as crowdsourced by, by everyone else. Uh, the, next, the next hope that I think um, kind of SuperSight might provide is this idea that, you know, we will never really be alone as we pass through the world anymore. It's kind of a funky one, <laughs> funky one. but once the world has these uh, labels and actions, I think now we can kind of consider that the glasses that we wear can have a set of, of, of coaches or services that might be able to assist us as we move through the world. Um, and uh, one of the examples that I really love from MIT um, was this uh, project called the Mood Meter, um, where people um, in public spaces all around campus uh, see um, a, pr a display and they see how happy they are as, as 
classified by this um, uh, um, by this projection. So. Uh, in a way, like it's a way of seeing like what are the happiest buildings on campus, what are the happiest groups on campus, and also what are the happiest times or you know times of day or times of year. So one of the things that we've learned, you know, is that people are get really grumpy at exam time, uh, but when there are more than a couple of people around, usually the happiness of a place increases because just as people look at each other, we kind of tend to smile. Um, but so these, you know, these agents, I think, will not only understand what we're seeing and labeling what we're seeing, but also understanding the, the, um, uh, the mood of the people that we're interacting with and help us to be maybe more empathetic. When I say super sight or when we think about AR, um, I think, you know, I've, I showed you pictures of glasses as a, as a, a projection plane for this information. But uh, the, big, the big news from the conference uh, today and yesterday was, there are a billion people that are already using this technology. And you say, what? Like, why are a billion people using glasses? No, it's a billion people that already have smartphones or tablets that have these toolkits of AR core and AR kit uh, that are allowing these, um, uh, these use cases, as, as awkward as they are, to kind of hold up your phone as you're shopping or whatever, there's still a, a way to prototype what this world might look like. And I think there's another couple as well that we should consider. One is the kind of see-through world, which is the two people standing side by side and having a shared augmented view of something. Um, and then the group around projected light view of AR, which I think is also AR. Um, the one that we've been working with at the Media Lab in the City Science Group is a projected AR view of, this is Kendall Square where MIT is. Uh, we built a Lego. Uh, model of Kendall Square. There are tags on the bottom of the building so you can move them around. And then you see an agent-based model that's calculating walkability scores or perception of risk at night if there's no one around or traffic ingestion or access to amenities or diversity of the uh, uh, cultural diversity or rent prices. Um, so all of those extra layers can be projected on this physical model of that, of that space. Um, and to, to me, that's really, that's, that's kind of an exciting use of AR because it's communal. People gather around this model and have arguments about the city. Uh, and, and kind of other, other AR layers um, are starting to pop up on sort of everyday objects. So this is a startup called Mirror and they kind of give you a yoga instructor, um, or a boxer to mirror your, uh, your workout in, the, in your house. Um, and uh, I'm working with uh, this company called Hydro, which is trying to do the Peloton for rowing, which also is kind of a type of AR, um, where this is a, rather than just seeing a, um, a, dis a Concept2 display that shows you stats, you're actually kind of projecting yourself into the body of this Olympic rower as you sit there doing your, doing your rowing and she's on the Charles River on Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire and it's, you know, it's, it's beautiful and she's beautiful and therefore you're beautiful because you're like, you kind of teleported into her somehow. And, but it's kind of, it's, I, to me, it's a, another type of AR. But again, this, I mean, I think of this as kind of powerful because it's a never alone experience. You know, someone's, someone's always with you helping you do your work. Uh, uh, my, my friend Salvador um, has a company called Memo Me. He's sitting where? Where are you, Salva? There. Um, that helps you uh, design your style or helps pick the right uh, fashion for you when you're shopping. So they make, a, they make another AR, which is really compelling, um, where if you're standing in front of a mirror at Neiman Marcus, you can see previous outfits with a swipe of your hand. So you can see real time or previous time. Um, you, also, if you're in Uniqlo, you can also see, uh, you can swipe to see different colors because they have like 87 colors of the same um, sweater, sweater. So you can kind of go through them rapidly without muffing up your hair. Um, so, but again, this is kind of a, um, a styled wish that we have to, um, to get some help uh, that AR can hope, hope to satisfy. Um, so at Warby Parker, we've been doing a couple of projects. A year ago, we launched um, a, a project where my team 
use the face mesh that's given by the um, iPhone 10 camera that unlocks your phone. Um, and we could determine uh, pupillary distance and nose bridge height and how wide your face is. And we could recommend frames that were purchased with pe by people with faces like yours. So we didn't, we didn't, we used historic data for who purchased which, who purchases which, who purchases which frames and doesn't return them, and then use that as uh, the basis of a recommender system. Um, but at that point, we, we didn't have enough 3D models and textures in order to do what we just launched a couple of weeks ago, which is, uh, actually a couple of months ago, which is um, virtual try-on. So here's me with hues narrow, um, and there's me with hues narrow. So it's even more compelling if I use the if, I, if you do the, the same color as you're wearing, you kind of, you can see how the, we worked a lot on the positioning algorithm. Um, and this maybe is one of the big uh, success stories, at least um, shopping is one of the big success stories for like, why will we use, ever use augmented reality? And so you see almost every category, Salva's doing this, a lot of this work, is getting into kind of visualizing yourself with, with stuff on that's appropriately sized. Um, so that you'll buy that ring, or you'll buy the makeup, or you'll buy those Nike shoes because they happen to look great on your foot. So my next category is really a, a, a more, even kind of more personal, uh, which is this hope that uh, robots may feed us. Um, I think this is a, a concept video, but it, um, it's intriguing to think about what form factor these robots will take in our kitchens. Is anybody working on this? The chef. More of an robotics for the home. Really. Comprises two robotic arms above a large cooking surface, including hobs, sink, and an oven. It certainly takes a lot of vision tech and also a lot of grasping tech. I think this is how it was done. Uh, the training, the training system was was parroted by a data glove worn, um, aspiring chef. Um, I think it's probably more likely that the use case for cooking for you or growing for you um, will be one where you kind of think about these computer vision systems as, as these infinitely patient eyes that are only willing to do one job for their entire life, which is to look down at your, at your salad or your whatever you're growing and um, make sure that the, you have the right amount of, uh, of water being, or juice being spritzed up at your aeroponic um, plants. Uh, but the advantage is that you know they have more patience than you will ever have to make sure that your plants are thriving, so your plants will grow really fast. Just kidding; these are not these are not real time, but they might be. Um, <laughs> um, so another uh, another uh, benefit I think of computer vision that we're starting to read about almost every uh, every week is um, how much they are uh, changing the world of and the jobs of doctors. Um, just uh, MIT CSAIL last, last week announced that they can predict breast cancer from mam mammography better than human experts. We kind of keep having these better than uh, events and um, that are cascading across the, the medical world and really um, sort of calling into question uh, what radio you know, how radiologists will do their workflow um, differently with these, with these systems. Um, there's there's a, a company that I'm especially excited about that's doing this for um, dermatology, and the reason that I'm excited is because um, a lot of people uh, suf suffer from st skin conditions where there there's a stigma associated with taking a picture of that part of your body or you know dropping your pants in front of that person that to look you know to your ger dermatologist in order to look at that part of your body. So I think these these kind of um, rashes. Uh, uh, are a good use case for computer vision uh, because people might be might feel like they're. Um, uh, I think security systems are important in this case, <laughs> um, but they can get the answers to the questions that they have um, through computer vision. Uh, the next one I th is kind of a mashup for me between uh, between the exciting world of gaming that is spreading out and being spatialized all over our world. You know, two or three years ago, Pokemon Go was just this phenomena that um, that changed the way people walked all over Boston. There were 
packs of crowd, you know, crowds of kids that were that were going down the street, and you said, like, are you protesting something? Like, what's like, what's happening? And they're like, no, there's like a Pokemon stop, and we can get uh, Pikachu right over there. Um, so. Uh, you know, the ga big game companies, uh, Minecraft Earth has just, been, you know, has, has been announced and soon will be all over your neighborhood. You know, my, these things populated all over your neighborhood. And the, the wizarding world of Harry Potter is also coming to, uh, to uh, a temple near you. Um, and uh, for me, this, this um, kind of the consequences of this uh, will mean this that, that the world of gaming and the vernacular of gaming and how you think about what you do um, will not only be gamified, but it will feel like a game. So at this conference today, there was a comp big company, PTC, Parametric Technology Corp. They compete with um, Autodesk and Dassault Systems uh, and uh, you know, do CAD CAM, but they're very interested in AR, but they've hired a bunch of game developers to help show AR what, how, how the machine is broken, where things, sh where, what the process should look like, where the danger zones around a machine are, and it, it looks just like it's right out of a video game, but it's an industrial use case. So that's like, it's interesting how there's this fusion. And um, has anybody, uh, ha does anybody have an Android and signed up uh, for this, for the beta, new beta of Google uh, Maps. Have you seen the Red Fox? Okay, well, apparently the world of maps is changing. So instead of like, since the days of the pirates where we had like a plan view of a map, here's the goal, you know, the treasure is over here, but everything was like looking down at a map. Now the way we think about mapping is like a Pokemon. It's like, you just follow the Red Fox. Where do you need to go? Like, we're not gonna give you a, sp a, a view, any kind of context of what the layout of the airport is or the building or anything. You just like follow the Pokemon character will be the way that we trail around the world. Um, uh, I mean, this, this gets a little bit frightening, but um, I've been wearing a, a life logging camera for the last couple of years and um, if you look at the little flip book that it gives you at the end of the day of how you spent all of your time, um, like you, you can use computer vision to figure out how much time was I in front of a screen versus interacting with people, how many people did I interact with, how many times did I snack. Um, for the people that I did interact with, were they all depressed too? Um, like are they, <laughs> or are they smiling back at you? So you kind of have a mood score based on this. Um, but when these glasses can start to like do this life log, life log of your day, um, I think we'll start to be able to count things and to give ourselves a little bit of uh, analytics about our own day and how we spent our time. Like that will be very available. Now the question of like, what, how long is the feedback loop is a really interesting one to me. You know, when you're like driving your Tesla, you kind of want to know fast if it doesn't see the car in front of you. Like that has to be like a less than a second feedback loop. but when you're getting coached about how you're spending your time or how well you're playing tennis or how your last ski run, like the curves on your last ski run, do you want real-time feedback for that? Or do you want to know the next time you're riding the lift or après ski? Like, I don't know, like how long should that feedback loop be? And, um, and how should that information be presented to you? Like, this is a good design question. Um, we, uh, to answer that, we built a table that helps, that tries to help do what a, what a facilitator might do. Um, did people read Susan Cain's book called Quiet? It kind of makes the point that um, they're introverts and extroverts, and um, the extroverts have just as many good ideas as you do, and, but you have to let them, let them out. So we made a, a table that tries to, in real time, give you subtle, augmented feedback about the conversation. Um, I, there's this little video that explains it. This is the balance table. It looks like an ordinary table, but there's something else important going on. A conversation where everyone participates is a balanced conversation. Really the moment that you want people to realize that there isn't balance in a meeting is right during the meeting, and then people will adjust. There are introverts and extroverts, and you really want the introverts 
to share their ideas, because they often have the best ideas, but they're often just suppressed in an organization by the extroverts. You get the idea. So, <laughs> so like that's an example of uh, an augmentation that has a feedback loop that's immediate, that's uh, something that everyone can see, that's not in someone's glasses, right? Make sense? Uh, so to, onto industrial use cases, uh, my, uh, my brother-in-law, Ed, is a firefighter. Uh, it doesn't seem at all creepy or overreaching for him to be able to see through smoke and see where the, where the sources of heat are in a building and to be able to get out and do his job. Um, so I, I kind of love these examples all day long. Um, uh, uh, at the conference today, we saw lots of industrial use cases. Um, this is one that has kind of a surprisingly fun and simple interface that's just a, a chalk uh, called Vuforia Chalk. There are lots of other uh, apps that do similar things, but um, it brings up some interesting ideas about should these cue marks that are made by another person on your field of view persist? And for how long should they persist? And should they, you know, should other people be able to see the cues in the world that you that you see? Um, and won't it just make a really messy world <laughs> if all if all marks that other people are making on the world uh, persist across other other people's marks? And can people graffiti up, you know, your the door of your house just because you're um, anyway? So there's there there are problems there. Um, to me, one of the most exciting things that has come out um, of the uses of, of AR is one, to kind of solve the video conferencing problem, especially if you're in a situation where you're, where you're talking with other people, you need to have this kind of fast back and forth to see what other people are interested in, to see where people are looking when they make ambiguous statements like, I'm confused about this. Or, I'm or I like that. <laughs> it's kind of back to the uh, one of the first Media Lab demos of put that there, where you're sitting in for you know you have to like infer gesture and gaze um, and voice in order to make that happen. So one of my students, uh, Jinha, started a company a with money from Samsung um, in order to. Can you turn it up a little bit? Let's see. What if our creativity could burst to life in the space around us? Spatial is a collective computing environment that lets teams visualize their thoughts in the room around them. Hey, Jess. So whether you're on a desktop computer or scribbling notes on your phone, all your digital devices are seamlessly tied together into an infinite workspace. You can manifest your ideas before your eyes by just saying them, and in a click, expand them with the power of all the world's information. I think the room, the room might get messy quickly. If you could like Google search like this, and then the results like show up on the wall. Um, but I think there are a couple things that are exciting about this. Um, one is the instant generation of, of avatars that do whose mouths move and whose eyes move with you. Um, Spatial brings people and ideas together into a I think what's also interesting is just that they're, the use case that they're solving for is one of the hardest ways. for video conferencing, which is generating new ideas, so grouping ideas, ideas voting on ideas, mind. things that you can only, usually only do in a workshop. Um, and Whether they're also being kind of headset, device agnostic, so you might be on an PC. iOS device or at a laptop, Anybody other people might have a $3,000 head-mounted display. They're finding a way to kind of incorporate everyone at whatever level of, of uh, computing that they have. From home or work. And obviously it benefits more Beyond if you're Mattel and talking space, about toys or architect talking about three-dimensional things. We never uh, possible. But you like that one? And unlock the power I think that's of our a sort of power, powerful one. Um, so I'm really intrigued. Uh, I have a background in education and kind of was brought up uh, uh, being captivated by SimCity. Um, I'm really, I have a couple of little kids and I'm, you know, loving all of the AR um, realness that's happening with, uh, with what, what my kids are learning um, through AR. Um, and to me, kind of the, mo the, the most compelling ones are pushing on this, on this two by two, where they're showing you things that either, either were too large, kind of powers of 10, city scale, galaxy scale things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, to see, or they're too small, kind of magic school bus land. Um, let's go down the, uh, 
small intestine, um, <laughs> or things that take way too long to play out, or things that are, that are so fast that you, they need to be slowed down. So all, like this kind of x-ray ability um, of AR, I think, is really exciting to push on these, on these limits. Um, one example of that uh, is an elevator in the World Trade Center. Um, has anybody been up this elevator? Uh, so it starts out. You're, un you're underground and you're in the year 15, 1532. And as you rise, you see the crane shot or drone shot that you're passing. So there's a one-to-one, -one, but you're also passing through forward through time to see the, the city as it as it's developed. So there's something really elegant about that, right? Because 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 it's the it's the glass elevator fantasy, but it's also the time travel, and they've kind of put those two ideas together. But then it's somehow more believable than just being in an AR a VR headset because you actually are captive in that elevator. Should look for more of these, like more of these kind of uh, examples. Um, I also like this one because yeah, it's another one that is kind of gluing the information to. Uh, the best teaching and learning happens when the children to your chest, like in a way that's really real things happening around them. Compelling and resonant. We've now gone from. You could argue that maybe now. that should just be an iPad app, but somehow like cooler if it's on the base of the body, um, and you're able to like peer into the chest. Uh, one of one of my, uh, I mean, Google Translate is awesome. This is the kind of like Google Translate for music. Uh, this is my daughter's cello piece, and we were, she was having a hard time with these uh, 16th note triplets, and uh, so we found an app called Music Scanner, and uh, you basically you you take a picture. Um, Uh, you know, basically, it like plays the piece that it that you see in the um, the, you, the sheet music becomes uh, transcribed <sighs> auditory, uh, and we're seeing museums do this, which I think is another uh, nice place for uh, because you can hand out iPads and do this in, in museums. But what about cars? <laughs> Um, we have a lot of people modeling cities at MIT, and one of the kind of um, unforeseen negative outcomes, I think, of, uh, of autonomy and self-driving is that we'll have cars from Volvo that look like first-class airlines, and you really just won't care. You won't care how long your commute is. You won't seek the, d the density of the city. Um, and, uh, and because the highways are totally subsidized, we'll have vehicles that look like this, and it'll be cheaper than we work um, because it's uh, it's just causing traffic on your um, in downtown San Francisco. But you're able to work, <laughs> uh, or you're able to park it there. Uh, <laughs> so this was a provocation that was done by IDEO about future of transportation, but really negative as far as, as I mean, as far as I I believe. So that's uh, th that's a little tour of I think some of the benefits and 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 and. Um, uh, like what we should think about when it comes to super sites. Um, and, you know, how, how soon will all of this happen? Like how soon will, all, where, will our eyes evolve? Um, you know, think about owls, the reason that they have, um, that they're optimized for large aperture night vision. Uh, they have elongated tubes that, um, uh, that have evolved so that their eyes don't even move so that they can uh, optimize for light gathering. Um, which is why their head needs to. So, uh, uh, so it took owls like a millennia to solve this problem. Um, but uh, you know, how fast will these future contacts or or glasses come? You know, be sold at Warby Parker stores. Um, the industry is tracking against a bunch of different parameters. Um, two of the most, the biggest are, uh, is it something that, that is light enough to wear on your face all day and doesn't look dorky? Um, and also, is the field of view something that's large enough so it's not annoying? Um, something that we saw at the show today was uh, these Enreal glasses, which do do simultaneous location and mapping, so they can glue information to the world, not just to your head. Um, large field of view, small enough, and uh, and I think one of the big uh, 
uh, disruptions is going to be one where you don't have to have a controller anymore, where you, you know, it can do fine-grained um, tracking of, of hands and grasping um, so that you can interact with the world, as we talked about. Was that the most impressive one that you guys saw? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, the Black Mirror is a wonderful show that teaches us all about <laughs> many of the negative consequences of this. Um, and this, this notion of diminished reality, I think, should be, uh, we should consider and explore uh, because um, in the same way that we can augment the world around us, we can also blur and use generative adversarial nets to take things away from our field of view, um, like the person that we divorced or the kids of the person that we divorced, which is the subject of this Black Mirror episode. Um, I'm interested in engaging with you on, on questions about, uh, about the future of sites, uh, but I have some suggestions for you in terms of like fun things to try. Um, the Warby Parker app is just the e-commerce app. You have to have an iPhone 10 in order to try these things on your face. Uh, photo math is kind of like the music one that solves math problems with computer vision. Uh, Wayfair and Ikea are both uh, experiencing huge success in allowing you to see how awkward that couch will be in your living room. Uh, living Wine Labels is a, ni is, is a nice uh, app that shows you um, wine labels come alive and uh, tell you their tales. Uh, uh, let's see. Shark for the AR shark is a nice uh, quick one. A music scanner I showed you, Google Maps, and if you have rashes that you don't want to talk about. Thank you very much. <laughs> So we have time for some questions. If you can wait for a mic to come to you, um, we'll get them. So how soon before one of these giants like uh, Facebook or Microsoft, well, Microsoft's going to go in for it, uh, Samsung or Apple, okay, ship something comparable for the consumer like the iPhone? Yeah, the rumors are. Um, uh, next year um, for, I mean, the rumors, the rumors are next year for Apple, like next fall. Um, I don't know whether that's true. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that like, all, of the, all of those companies are putting the tools together to enable, right? So, there's, so in, on Andrew, Android and Apple, there's AR Core and AR Kit, which make it easy for people to author 3D content. Um, there are... Um, Facebook has a Facebook Studio, which allows you to easily like locate things in space or locate things on people's person. Uh, uh, those those are at least two of the important kind of enabling technologies. So all the, all of the big platforms are working on the enabling technologies, making it work on phones now, and then uh, the kind of the interesting uh, business question is how walled will their gardens be? Um, when, you know, when Apple comes out with something, will there be an app store on your face? And who gets access to the app store? And can you leave persistent marks on your lawn? Can anyone leave persistent marks? Like the Vuforia chalk example. Like, can, can a game company put games on your lawn um, or in your place of business that other people will see? Um, like, do we? Um, there's a whole kind of legal, there will be an interesting legal battle fought about the sort of the, um, the rights that um, spaces have to govern what can be done in those spaces. So I have two related questions. First is, um, I don't know if you've read uh, the age of surveillance capitalism yet? Uh, I heard the I heard the inter the interview, but I haven't read the book. I highly recommend it, mm. and certainly the potential for the kind of information that might be gathered by using some of these visual systems mm. mm -hmm. to be used in a kind of surveillance sort of way seems great. So I'm kind of wondering your thinking on that. And the other great is, means sorry by by uh, when you use the word great, you mean uh, large. large. Right. Yes. Yes. Right. yes, I, I yes. meant that way. And the other thing is, uh, you know, in trying to kind of go beyond the, okay, mapping and, you know, even product suggestions and whatnot, mm. really looking further out, I mean, it seemed the thing that 
you touched on that has the greatest potential, potentially, if it's controlled by the user, is the kind of the coaching mm. thing where something could be observing what you're doing, your diet, your activity level, mm -hmm. or whatever, and mm -hmm. making useful commentary. But then, of course, it comes back again to who owns that information. Is your insurance company going to yeah. know whether you're going to the gym or not, or right. is it just going to be information that you're using privately? Yes. Yeah, I mean, something that we're seeing um, that seems very intrusive just viscerally is um, a lot of the new headsets can look at your can look at what you're looking at and and not only what you're attending to but also like the dilation of your pupil the how your eyes cicading around um, which can be like machine learned to figure out emotional states um, they're using it for customer research now <laughs> so that you can put on glasses and look at an apartment or look at a car and without and subconsciously the system figures out sort of what you're drawn to and at the, or, or to ask anyone. Like there's no talk out loud protocol anymore of like, tell me where you're confused with this system. It's just like that can be divined in not a divine way. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested in your sh thoughts on sort of the social implications and we already have distracted driving or distracted mm. walking or mm -hmm. This is just going to make things much worse that way. And uh, do you anticipate there's going to be legislation for, you know, getting fined for walking around a city and bumping into things? I mean, it seems like solitude is going to become a rarity anymore. Yeah, I, th I, th I, th I'm, I think you're right. I think it's going to be like a cacophony, um, mostly. Although there's the diminished reality argument, which is like maybe more things will be like a walk in the woods. If you if you so decide, you know. I mean, maybe 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 we'll have a more a, a more call. There'll probably be an app for that. If you want to, you know, if you if you want to hide the things that are less interesting to you or that aren't uh, lifting you up in the right way, you know, <laughs> can, all that can just be dis, you know disappeared. Uh, I do think it will be continuous connection and continuous coaching and continuous, um, and it will just. You know, the things that were on your phone that you were glancing at, you'll decide, do they go here? Do they go here? Do they go here? Um, or do they just tickle your ankle with the haptic ankle tickler? <laughs> but they will be distributed out across these, you know, mul these multiple things and rings. Yes? Um, I think there's an interesting challenge with, like, all of the really cool things you can do involve having a camera on your face at all times, basically. But it's kind of like building on the previous questions, but how do you think we, or people who are excited about this tech, are going to actually start um, in terms of solving like the trust and the privacy issues? Because it's like, it's, it's like all the cool stuff comes with like massive implications. Big tech right now isn't particularly known for how it handles those implications. So like, do you think it's going to require indies or some specific use cases that like more intense or can somehow justify the privacy cost? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I've been clustering the problems but not solving them. <laughs> so, like, my my clusters of, of like, the six categories, you're, you're touching on a couple. Like, one is the bubble filter problem. Another one is the surveillance state problem. Another one is the persuasive com big company problem. Another one is the equity and access problem. Another one is the we'll get dumb about a lot of things, cognitive crutch problem. And the last is the it's going to be like the 60s, um, like it's, which was your kind of like it's going to be crazy. Like all, like all, of these, uh, all of these layers of information brought to you by different brands you know, are, are going to be something that it will be possible. And who, like, whose job is it to curate those that possibility, um, and I, I don't know. I mean, Google Glass is interesting because it's one of the few technologies that, as a society, we've really rejected, right? Like we've, like, can what's your other favorite example of a, of a technology that, as a society, for privacy reasons that we really decided, um, or social interaction reasons that we really didn't embrace? Flippy. What Flippy? Clippy, yes. Oh, yeah, Clippy. Also, the clapper. I thought the clapper was pretty cool. <laughs> no, can someone come up with another example of a, of a rejected tech 
that was rejected for kind of a privacy or social interaction genetic motivation? Testing. Yes, genetic testing. <laughs> was it? Why, why did we reject the segue? So it was a fashion rejection. I mean, it wasn't just reborn as, as electric as Bird and Lime and those guys. What was? Oh, yeah. Oh, like Microsoft Health and Google Health and the idea of owning your own data brought to you by, brought to you by those, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Hmm. I see, like a persistent note, yeah. Yes? So I was thinking that maybe, that with that technology, may, if you can see many different things, like that might be a, re a really good field for advertisement. Like if you look at a chair, you might be able to see the diff different brands of chairs. And um, how, what, do you think that would, do you think that people would, how do you think that people would react to, to, ha to seeing advertisements all over their view? I wouldn't, that's a really good question. Uh, I do not want advertisements all over my view. I mean, I, I, I started a company called Ditto that tried to do kind of a pervas pervasive bookmarking or shopping interface, and that was rejected. <laughs> That's another one that was rejected. But that, I didn't think of it, 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 it is an e-commerce mechanism, but it wasn't really an advertisement mechanism. Um, I don't know, I think it's kind of a fine, like what is the line between having something labeled so you know what it is, and, have, and advertising? Like you could say, that light was you know, designed by uh, Jean Prouvé, and it was done in 1963, and um, it's available at Design Within Reach. Like that, the last thing is advertising, or the, like showing the providence of something feels more like a history lesson, or curiosity, or Wikipedia. And then the last bit of like, I want to bookmark that or save that maybe feels like, a, like the crossing into promotion. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm still surprised that Amazon is selling uh, e-book readers. They should just be giving those away. And I think in the same way, you could think of a totally sponsored model for all these uh, headsets that are now $3,000. It'll be $300 in a couple of years. Um, but they probably will be free if there's enough uh, pervasive ads that you know, brought to you by your biggest ad uh, channels. Um, yeah. I'm sure they are. I mean, I think for a lot of the coaching ones, there may be uh, health savings arguments. Uh, when when I, I developed a product that was an internet-connected medication package, and it was paid for by either uh, yourself or your family member, and the drug company who's making more money selling more meds, and the insurance company that's making more money by reducing hospital visits due to medication and non-adherence. All three, like all three parties, were paying for it in some cases at the same time. So, uh, I mean, if there's if there's a behavioral change that is in a healthy direction, that could be another subsidized model that se doesn't seem evil. I so I'm um, curious. Uh, so I mean, in this ever connected world, we've got kind of in higher rates of depression and all this sort of bombardment of, mm. of information, everything all the time. I'm wondering if you're finding, if people are doing any studying or, or studies on if we're going into this direction where it's a whole other level of sort of being engaged instead of just being on a screen. Is anyone looking at kind of mental health impact on user? Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, like what will it do to us? Yeah, I'm just 
wondering if people are starting to study it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I mean, I think there are a lot of people that are studying like what the phones are doing to us and shortening extension attention spans and, and reducing empathy in kids. Um, and I'm sure that those will be magnified when we can, when we have blinders on. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, in my own, um, I'm really conflicted about the, like, on one hand, it's very exciting to think about all of, the, all of the positive uses. On the other hand, like, how many people next year, if they weren't too expensive, would want to try a smart, you know, wearing smart glasses around, not for a specific architectural task or rendering task, but just as kind of a, like, I'm going to a new city and want to, want to experience it in a different way. Most? Most? Try it? Yeah. Show you now. Okay, so um, in the um, glasses, so it'll show the world and it'll also show the things that you want to look at. Like, how is that possible? How will the screen come up? How how does it show inside the glasses? Mm. Well, I showed you that first example. Um, there's a there. Uh, these glasses use a, uh, a projector that's concealed in the temple of the glasses in order to project something onto the surface of the glass that your eye then sees superimposed. You see through this on to the rest of the world. Um, that's kind of the simplest thing to do, where this information is stuck to your head. So as you turn your head, the information is there. And the other technology that we talked about, the simultaneous location and mapping, is one where there are cameras that are seeing what you're seeing and labeling what you're, what you're seeing and figuring out the boundaries of things and how far they are away. Um, in the same way that Microsoft Connect could kind of draw an outline around your body and see that you're you know, gesturing or doing Dance Dance Revolution. So it's kind of doing Dance Dance Revolution on everybody else. <laughs> uh, and then it, can, it knows what those, what those curves look like or those paths, and then they can have, like something can pop up from behind that guy, but it would be in front of that guy. You see what I mean? So that you can, and that thing can be cast out of focus as well. So just like your eye has, can rack focus back and forth between reading and between seeing at infinity, um, the things at infinity when you're reading would also be out of focus, even if they're generated by the, by the projector. Yes. Let's do, let's do one more. Yeah, let's one more question. Let's have a or something. <laughs> How much a difference in the vision of people will affect any cost and development? Can you say it again? Is that the problem with the, uh, like nearsightedness and other vision problems, uh, or is it a big problem for manufacturing or not? Um, is oh can, are you asking whether the whether the glasses can Let's be focus tunable this, so that you can uh, correct this for one reading glasses? You project on the uh, glasses. Yes. Not everybody will see it, right? Because it's uh, something in front of your eyes. Some near side people will not see it or something. So you have to produce every pair of glasses spe specifically for people who will wear them. So how much of the problem is it? Yeah, so, so with these North glasses, you have to fill them with prescription lenses that fit the correction that you need for your, for your eyes. Um, that sounds like a big problem. It does, yeah. And this, one, of the, one of the reasons why this company, why Warby Parker didn't partner with this company is because, is because of that hassle that all, this has to be, you have to be individually fitted. They have to know the geometry of your face and exactly where your pupils are in order to make this show up at the right distance. And if you kind of squunch your nose, it kind of flies way off in that direction. So it's very, it's very sensitive, the, the positioning. Um, and you do need to get prescription lenses. So it's, an, it's awkward, and it was $1,000 plus prescription lenses, and now it's $600 plus prescription lenses. Um, I've heard like next year they're gonna do a new version, it's gonna be much better, but I think but your other question was about focus tunable lenses, which are, which are possible. Um, so you can 
you know, some people have trifocals, bifocals, and progressives. Um, and you can actually, there's technology so that you can make the one lens that racks focus when it knows that you have a book in front of you or looking at your iPhone or whatever. Um, and then the whole lens changes when you're looking in distance driving. Great. Thank you Great. so much, David. Yeah, Thank you so engaging. much for coming. Thanks. So just so that you know, in two weeks' time, we have our next forum. It's David Henkel Wallace, and he has founded a company called Leela, and it's based on um, an AI agent uh, for child development. So uh, please register online. It's uh, looking like it's going to be also um, a good forum to come to. So again, it's available already for registration online. Thank you very much.